Hi, we're out on our range today, and if I've timed this correctly, today's presentation will air just in time for Halloween, making this our Halloween special. Now, typically for Halloween specials, I want to do something fun, but today I want to start with talking about something that's a little more serious, and that is the concept of you being the designated adult that's been tasked with taking a group of kids trick-or-treating. I want to discuss some of the things you might want to make sure you take with you, some of the things you might want to make sure the kids take with them, and I'm going to start with the bag. Now, this is a vinyl bag. I got it at the dollar store. It seems sturdy enough to the task. It's got a round bottom, so you can actually set it on the ground as long as there's some stuff in it. It can be self-supporting. And it's got this really nice drawstring. When you're finished trick-or-treating and you're on your way home, you can zip that shut, and it might help keep your damn brother from stealing some of your Halloween candy. I find bags like this far superior to bags like this one, because this is kind of chintzy, and it's made of paper. Anywhere I've ever been for Halloween carried with it a very good chance of rain. Bags like this are susceptible to rain. Now, talking about rain, there's a product you can get that's a disposable rain poncho and it'll fold up really small. Great idea. I'm not going to carry something like that. I'm just going to carry this lawn and leaf garbage bag. And if the need arises, I can take this, cut head and arm holes in it, put it over me like the old Boy Scout field expedient poncho. For me, I think it'll work fine. Now, another thing we have to discuss is the concept of Halloween masks. Now, when I was a kid, that meant a decorative mask. Today, with the beer situation, it can mean a couple of different things. Now, when I talk about masks and the beer situation, please keep in mind I am not recommending any course of action. What you're going to do is going to be based on what you think is right for you and whatever local regulations they're enforcing in the jurisdiction in which you reside. When I go into places that require the wearing of a mask, it should come as no surprise that I'm going to wear just a procedural mask. I find them very convenient. I think they're effective. I get them at the clinic. Now, side note, you notice that one side of this is white and one side is purple. They come in several different decorative colors. However, when I look at this, and this is the way it has been in all the years that I've been a healthcare professional, the seams are on the purple side. The metal strip so you can form it around your nose is visible from the purple side, not so much from the white. Everything about this tells me that it's meant to be worn with the white side out. Some people will disagree with me. But if you choose to wear a mask on Halloween, something I would say that since it's Halloween, a more decorative mask is called for. Now on the subject of children's Halloween masks, many different things out there, but something I've always heard is the recommendation that it's a mask that doesn't interfere with the child's vision. I think that's a good idea. I would add to that that it's something that, if possible, shouldn't interfere with your hearing either. Obviously, vision is very important to keep you from running out into traffic, but hearing is important too. Now, something that I've heard recommended, and I absolutely endorse this idea, is if your costume allows for it, instead of wearing a mask, wear makeup. That certainly won't in interfere with your vision or your hearing. And of course, for you as the designated adult, you might have to carry some extra makeup with you. Some of the kids will want to touch up as they go. Now, what about removing the makeup? Well, you'd usually do that when you get home. But, wherever you do it, when you're dealing with kids, you can never have too many moist towelettes. I could probably carry a backpack full of these, and it wouldn't be excessive. However, rather than carrying the pre-moistened towelettes, something I like to carry are these compressed washcloths. You add water and it'll expand, and they're very useful. Of course, that means you have to carry water. Doesn't take much. This is a 10 ounce bottle of water. Not only can it expand your washcloth, you might want to drink some as you go. And remember, it doesn't matter how many times you tell the kids, don't eat any of your candy until you get home. They're going to eat some. They're probably going to be thirsty. Carrying a little bit of water is not a bad idea. Now I want to show you a different way that I sometimes carry water when I'm in the field. When I don't want to use my LBV, I just want to carry a little bit of water this flask. It's an eight ounce flask, 
because of the thinness and the shape of it, it is extremely convenient to carry in my cargo pocket. I would recommend everybody getting one of these. However, for you as the adult, when you have kids, when you're trick-or-treating, you're thirsty, you pull that thing out, you know it's water, but the crazy old lady down the block does not, and horrors. You really have to carry something that's more obviously water. Now, another thing that's important to carry is, of course, a flashlight. You don't have to carry your six cell mag light, just something that's convenient to carry. And me being me, I'm going to carry two of them. I could probably go on about the stuff you should carry for hours, but I just wanted to hit the high points. And you see, I put all this stuff in my pockets. Well, remember, if you're out there and you're carrying a bag, That'll certainly be okay if that's what you need to carry all that stuff. Now, there's one other thing that, of course, people are going to be asking about, and we have to discuss it. As the designated adult, it's your job to keep the children safe from many different things, but I want to discuss primarily two. One of those is keep them safe from doing stupid things like running out into traffic. You also have to keep them safe from being victimized. And the question comes up, should you or shouldn't you carry your gun? Okay, again, I am not recommending any course of action. No one can decide what's right for you except you. But if you decide you're going to carry your gun with you while you're taking kids trick-or-treating, there's a couple of recommendations I want to make. Let's take a look. When you're an adult and you take the kids out trick-or-treating, a lot of adults will want to dress in costume. I've certainly done that. I'm not going to dress in costume today because I don't want to detract from the seriousness of the point I'm about to make. And what some adults will do is they'll make a firearm part of their costume. You'll dress up in something that looks like a military uniform, put on your old Y harness, and carry your pistol. Looks like part of your costume, but it's very real. Now, a lot of people think they're being clever when they do that. There are two problems with that. One, I have gone to costumed events, not out trick-or-treating, but to costumed events, where I have dressed up as whatever and made a firearm part of my costume, unloaded, of course. But when I've done that, a surprisingly high number of people have looked at me and said, is that a real gun? You're not fooling nearly as many people as you think. Another problem with that is, if you're doing open carry, most of the time that'll be fine. People are at some distance. But on Halloween, when you're taking the kids trick-or-treating, it's very possible they will be very close to you. And it only takes about one second for some kid to demonstrate that your gun is very real. Now, what other adults will do is they'll dress in costume and carry a toy gun. Okay, on Halloween, when someone sees a little kid carrying a gun, they presume it's a toy gun, especially if that gun looks like it's part of a costume. He's dressed as a cowboy or a soldier or something like that. But what some adults will do is dress up in a costume and carry a toy gun. The problem with doing that is the same crazy old lady down the street that had a fit about your flask is going to have a fit about your gun. Another problem is, again, you're in close proximity to the kids you're with, and it's going to take about one second of carelessness before some kid demonstrates that your toy gun is very real, with disastrous results. So, if you're going to carry your gun on Halloween, what gun should you carry? How should you carry it? Let me show you a couple of things. There are many different carry methods. We have a presentation on carry methods. I could go on about it all day, but there's two I want to discuss specifically for Halloween where concealment becomes even more important than it typically is and control of the firearm becomes even more important than it typically is. One of those methods is plain old pocket carry. Pocket carry has a couple of downsides, such as if this hand is engaged and you have to do a single-handed, non-dominant hand presentation, it can be difficult. But pocket carry is very secure, very concealed. Another carry method I like, specifically for Halloween, is a shoulder holster. Many different types. The one I like the most is this Bianchi design. 
And I make no secret of the fact that typically I'm not a big fan of shoulder holsters. They're fine for some people in some situations, just not so much for me. However, for Halloween, I make an exception. In this case, it keeps it very secure and very well hidden. Now this brings up the question, would I carry a different handgun on Halloween than I would any other day of the year? Actually, the answer to that is yes. Let me show you some of the handguns that I might choose to carry on Halloween. And of course, remember, these are not recommendations, just some of my choices. On Halloween, I'll replace my Beretta 92FS with the Sig Sauer M17. It's a striker action, it has a rail system. There's other differences between this and the 92FS, which some people would consider advantages and some wouldn't. But for me, the big advantage on Halloween is this has tritium illuminated sights. Trick or treating will probably be done in the dark. If I'm called upon to need my pistol, the illuminated sights would help. They certainly won't help right now, but let's shoot it. Let's take a look at the target. And the results are not bad. Next on my list is the SIG P365. Very important to point out that this is the one that does not have the manual safety. If I were going to carry this in my pocket, it would have to be in the correct holster. This is a pistol that no matter how you carry it, in my opinion, must be carried in the proper holster. But it's also 9x19, it's light, it's compact. When I bought it, it came with two 10-shot magazines. 12-shot magazines are readily available, and it has tritium illuminated sights. Let's shoot it. Let's take a look at the target. And again, not bad. There's one more handgun on my list, and that is my Colt government model in caliber 38 super automatic. This does not have tritium illuminated sights, so why would I pick this one? And there's a very specific reason. And that is, with all the firearms and ammunition that I have at my disposal, caliber 38 super auto is the only caliber for which I currently possess silver bullets. Now, what do I mean when I say silver bullets? What I did was I took Winchester Silver Tip, caliber 38 super automatic, 125 grain jacketed hollow point, and I filled in that hollow point's cavity with silver alloy. So now that projectile does have a significant amount of silver in it. Let's take a close up look at them. And here's two rounds of the Winchester Silver Tip 38 super auto. The one on your left in its original form, the one on your right, having had the hollow point cavity filled with the silver alloy. So how effective will our silver bullets be against a werewolf? Well, to put that to the test, we're going to use the werewolf meat target, which is leather jacket skin followed by pork steak pectorals, pork ribs, a bag of oranges to simulate lung tissue, more pork ribs on the back, but the werewolf doesn't have any clothing, he's naked, he just has his fur. And I'm going to shoot this target from a distance of seven yards with the Colt government model which is loaded with the Winchester Silver Tip 125 grain jacket hollow points in their original configuration, and we'll use this as a basis of comparison. Well, I've got our werewolf taken apart, and we see some pretty good damage to the ribs on the front of the target. A lot of damage to our orange lung tissue. The ribs on the back of the target have some pretty good holes in them, and our projectiles were stopped by the werewolf skin on the back of the target, or by the first couple of layers of fleece. Let's take a close-up look at the projectiles. I only recovered three of the projectiles. Here they are, and we see some very good expansion. Now I've set up a new werewolf meat target, and I have my Colt government model loaded with the silver bullets. I'll shoot this from seven yards and see what kind of results we get. And yes, I'm aware of the angle of the sun, but this time of day at this time of year, that's what we have to work with. I recovered all the projectiles. Some were stopped by the hide on the back of the werewolf. A couple of them made it through to about the 30th layer of fleece. 
This time, let's take a close-up look at the projectiles before we dissect the meat target. And here's what I recovered. You see that one has a little damage, but almost no expansion. Some expanded a great deal, several of them lost their jackets. So inconsistent performance, but significantly more penetration in this configuration. Well, I've got the meat target taken apart, and there's quite a bit of damage, but what's even more interesting is that in addition to oranges, there was also limes and pineapple in this werewolf. It turns out he was a werewolf of London, which of course I should have recognized before even firing because his hair was perfect. Now in just a moment, we're going to go deeper into the forest and I'm going to find the right place to tell you a story. But this story comes with three caveats. One, it's not specifically about Halloween, but I think Halloween is a good time to tell it. Two, it's not my story. Somebody else told this story, I'm just repeating it. And three, there are different versions of this story. You can look at different online sources, you can read different books, and you'll find different versions. So please don't try to inform me that I'm telling it wrong because there are different versions of the story. Okay, let's find a place to tell this. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, as I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had tried to borrow, from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So to slow the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'Tis some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more." Presently my heart grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came tapping, and so faintly you came rapping, rapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal had dared dream before. But the stillness was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Only this and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely there is something at my window lattice. Let me see what thereat is in this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, and with many flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. Yet we cannot help agreeing that no sublunary being has yet been blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast perched upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the flaccid bus spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I what it utters is its only stock in store. Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, so when hope he would adjure, stern despair returned instead of that sweet hope he dared adjure, that sad answer, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling, all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then into the cushion sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gone, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining, on the velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath sent thee, by these angels he hath lent thee. 
respite, respite, and nepenth my memories of Lenore. Let me quaff this kind nepenth and forget the lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this house of horror haunted, tell me, tell me, I implore. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. By the heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within some distant Aden, it shall clasp a saint and maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest in the night's Plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of the lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken and quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming in the lamplight or him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore.